Last week's burst of protests across China seemed to subside as quickly as they erupted this week. Or did they? Overnight clashes breaking out in the southern port city of Guangzhou. Social media images from the megacity's Haizhou district include the sound of glass breaking, shouting, arrests followed. The clashes came hours after local authorities announced a partial loosening of lockdown rules in that city. Signs of uh, lingering fury over the country's zero COVID policy also visible in Shanghai where a video posted on social media shows residents confronting health workers in hazmat suits. Are these isolated incidents, or are citizens ready to brave the consequences of defying authorities in Xi Jinping's China? We'll also be asking our panel about the timing of Charles Michel's visit to Beijing. Mm -hmm. Is the presence of the European Council there to do business or show tough love? How to know if it's a blip or a turning point what's happening more broadly? How times have changed? The death of former uh, President Jiang Zemin at 96, a reminder of uh, the contrast between the days of booming trade with the West and the present zero COVID protests that follow the recent lifting of term limits for Xi Jinping. What next for the regime? What next for its leader? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the fresh blowback and mixed messages surrounding China's zero COVID policy. Joining us from Washington, Zhongyang Lu, researcher at the Council on Foreign Relations. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Jean-François Dimeglio is president of the Asia Center Think Tank. Good evening. Nice to see you again. Nice uh, to see as well economist Jean-Paul Chang. And we're in the, we're welcome to, we welcome uh, back uh, Mario uh, Oltzman, president of Solidarité Chin, Sol, uh, China Solidarity, the advocacy group. Thank you for being with us. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. After the weekend protests came the Monday phone calls. Citizens asked to report to police stations after being identified on camera. And yet, they are still speaking out. It's a France 24 exclusive report by our team in Shanghai, and it's read by Yana Lee. This Shanghai resident took part in a rare street protest against China's strict anti-COVID measures. For his safety, we won't show you his face. I'd never seen a protest like that in Shanghai. It's because of the health restrictions and general oppression. We've reached our limit. The protest was peaceful, but police have started to detain more and more people. I saw someone who just said, I have the right to be here, it's legal. And a dozen police officers surrounded him. They beat him and took him away. No one dared to film it. We were too scared. Our interviewee says he'd like to protest again, but fears the authorities' swift and brutal crackdown. I'm pessimistic that things will change. In our country, there's no freedom of speech. We feel totally powerless. Authorities have a reinforced police presence in China's economic capital. Here, where the protests took place, there are new CCTV cameras, patrols and barricades. The once lively shopping street is now barely recognizable. Tuesday, Shanghai police were caught on camera in the metro, checking passengers' phones to look for photos of the protest. But despite attempts at nipping this movement in the bud, some people are intent on showing their exasperation. Tuesday evening in the southern city of Guangzhou, anti-riot police clad in hazmat suits clashed with demonstrators. To appease citizens, local authorities have announced a slight easing on COVID restrictions, but on a national level, Beijing has not yet changed the principle of its zero COVID policy. Zhongyang Lu, these, these, these fresh images from social media, are we making too much of them or are they significant? Thank you uh, for the great question. I would have to admit that um, uh, being outside of China and uh, my only source of these, um, the current protests so far have been from social media. So that makes me wonder uh, and be uncertain about the scale of these protests because uh, you know this is the image that we uh, oftentimes we 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 have when uh, the same for Chinese people who view America or view Europe this, in, in the sense that if they are only source or from social media or from video footages then it's hard 
to get a sense of how many people are actually participating, how large the scale is, and what exactly is going on behind the scene. Uh, however, I would have to admit that um, um, based upon a lot of reputable source, reputable uh, media sources, it does seem that uh, not just major cities in China, such as Beijing or Shanghai, but other uh, inner inland cities, including Chongqing, have um, you know people from all walks of life going into uh, the street. It's not just a university student. There are also people in community, residential areas. So I would have to say it, it's really hard for us to estimate the exact scale. But we can. We are. We are confident to say that it's uh, happening um, more than in places more than just the major cities. Are, are you surprised just by those social media images we're seeing uh, uh, from the city that used to be called Canton? Ah, uh, yeah, right. So personally, am I surprised by the protest uh, per se? I would say no. Actually, I'm not surprised by the uh, the protest for two reasons. The first reason is that uh, m m people going onto the street protesting for certain things is not unheard of in China. Previously, uh, there there were uh, a lot of stories about you know Chinese pro people protesting against the Japanese and things like that. However, this time is different because it's not about the target of the protest. It's not about um, a foreign uh, action, but indeed it's about the Chinese domestic politics. And it's just one thing is the implementation of zero COVID. And then the second reason I'm not surprised is because uh, the implementation of zero COVID have long, su long suppressed the negative emotions being boiling uh, inside the Chinese people as well as Chinese society. Therefore, you know, the fire in Xinjiang, Wulmuchi, the capital of Xinjiang province, the fire sparked the protest, but it reflected the deeper and uh, long suppressed negative emotions. All right, uh, Zongyang, you mentioned now uh, we're watching all this from the outside. There's this Western perception, uh, if you will, uh, or this outside world perception of what's happening uh, inside of China. One of those perceptions is that uh, now China's surveillance state is so sophisticated uh, that uh, it discourages uh, any kind of protest. It was interesting to see the New York Times pick up on uh, this one-man army that was seen over the weekend in Shanghai, uh, a man in the social media footage uh, verified by the uh, Reuters news agency. Uh, there you see him. I'm saying, I'm holding flowers. Is that a crime? Uh, and then uh, police officers uh, draw in. The crowd responds, no. Some are even saying, uh, let go. And Mario, it's when you look at those images, you see the other people are, are filming the police while it's happening. It's the, the digital age works both ways. <laughs> Indeed, indeed, we are very happy that the digital age is here because the the official press doesn't publish anything about what's going on. So if we didn't have those things, we would know nothing about China. So this is very convenient for us because otherwise we would have nothing to talk about. Has this has the events of the last week changed your perception? Because how many reports have we seen here in France uh, about uh, how if you're in China, you're constantly monitored, uh, they're checking your phone uh, even before? Before COVID. Well, that doesn't mean that they don't check their phones. Uh, it, this means that the pressure cooker has uh, exploded, so they can control themselves. Uh, on one hand, the Chinese people are really, really angry after three years of confinement, of very violent confinement, and the police now finds it very hard to contain that uh, anger. It's not surprising that it does go on, because uh, all that anger has to come out, has to be expressed. And also, we know that they're building more confinement places. I heard something like 80,000 more beds uh, for confinement for the next confinements. So this can't make the Guangzhou people happy. This is happening in Guangzhou. Uh, Jean-Paul Cheng, your, your thoughts on this? And again, the, the, these perceptions that we have from the outside uh, looking in, particularly when it comes to this issue of, uh, oh, well, uh, the Chinese, they can keep tabs on everyone and nobody's going to protest. No, well, that's not true. I mean, we, we all know that uh, there have been a lot of protests, social protests, for different reasons, not only on the subject of uh, 
in, in, in link with uh, foreign countries, uh, but for um, the foreign production of uh, of uh, um, people uh, who 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 are risking their saving in the real estate, for, for example, uh, the labor conflict exists in China as well. And so we know that there are a lot of, uh, which is this time a little bit uh, surprising, is the speed of uh, spreading from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, from that apartment uh, block uh, fire in Xinjiang, Xinjiang and uh, in Urumqi and the street Urumqi in Shanghai, you know, so, and that's that's uh, so symbolic that uh, and it's it's uh, purely politic, you know. Uh, uh, so this uh, and th and those that are out on the streets, they're rich and poor, different social classes, at least according to those yeah, images. Yeah. What, what is not surprising is what uh, we we all say that uh, the pressure. Uh, uh, because of the restriction uh, uh, anti-COVID measures uh, lasted too long. So everybody wants to shout, uh, cry, and uh, you know, nobody is happy with all these restrictions. But this is the same in all countries facing the COVID. We have the same problem of protesting in, in Western countries, in France as well. You know, each time you have, uh, you have uh, the lockdown or, or restrictions, and nobody is happy. So in China as well. So Chinese And people, imagine if ours had lasted three and a half years. No, that's not completely exact because it's not, in a continue, it's not a continuous lockdown during three years. Actually, it has been a first period in Wuhan after that, they actually they succeeded to, to, to stop the spreading of the... And then they had a good time, you know, compared to all countries. And uh, everything started again this year in, uh, in spring, when the Omicron uh, uh, arrived in China and they, they discovered suddenly that actually Chinese uh, society is not immune against the Omicron. And the Omicron has been spreading uh, much faster than the, what the... Uh, they got before. So we we'll say, I, I would say maybe six months of uh, heavy pressure. Uh, at the same time, you have this political pressure be before the 20, uh, 20th Congress. Which is now finished. It was it's last finished, month. But just, believe, uh, ju just re remember that uh, stability, social stability is so important uh, in the achievement of, uh, of uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, as he claimed in his uh, uh, speech in the 20th Congress. So at every level of the administration, uh, local, regional, uh, central, everybody was putting pressure to maintain the stability, no uh, exceptional uh, incident about the COVID. So of course, it's kind of double, double pressure and uh, is result today to, to this uh, explosion, which and, is and, expected. And as Marie Holtzman was, was saying, Jean-François de Meglio, there seems to be mixed messages. On the one hand, uh, making preparations uh, for more lockdowns, but on the other, um, we saw at the beginning those images uh, out of Guangzhou. Uh, they, there, they announced some loosening of measures, certain oh, measures uh, loosened. Uh, I think, indeed, we have three levels of discontent. Uh, the first level is, of course, what we just said, wh which is the lockdowns, which have lasted qu quite, quite, quite a long time. Uh, the second is also the uh, global economic environment, which goes along uh, this situation. But there is one uh, extremely uh, uh, discouraging aspect of the current situation in China for the Chinese citizens, which is confusion. Actually, when it's not about lockdown. It's about understanding what it is about. Because when you move currently from one city to the other, you don't even know whether you will show green, red, how long it will. Green, red means whether you're safe or not safe and uh, free to travel from one so place what is to that the other. So what does that confusion it, you know, tell you? What well, you know, at the very beginning, of course, lockdown could be, uh, of course, understood. Uh, there was a lot of explanation, there was a lot of uh, acceptation by the people, of course, as long as it doesn't last too long, one. But second, the situation where we are now, just because of what you said, there are some relaxing, some more lockdowns, and also uh, um, lack of common approach by the provinces, by the local authorities, because some are but, using some systems. So people don't exactly know whether it's stability, whether it's protecting the people, whether it's 
stressing the lockdown just because they want to control the people. So, so you know, wait, wait, if you want stability, you have to be understood. You have to deliver clear messages. Yeah, we had that problem here as well. What, but what, but what, what happened? Because la you were here just last month when we were talking <laughs> yes. about the 20th Party Congress yes. and saying how uh, under Xi Jinping, it's a more top-down approach. Uh, yes. uh, the chain of command is more centralized. So what's, what you're saying is the well, message is not coming down from, from yeah, Beijing? Well, uh, Possibly not in in English, but possibly in French as well. Uh -huh. uh, on, on, same place. I also said that um, the fact that Xi Jinping was so much assertive didn't mean that this assertiveness could last that long. Mm. Well, that was on the 17th of October. Anyways, uh, the point here uh, is that we are seeing a face of China, which we tend very often to forget. Uh, Chinese people are brave as opposed to what we do think in the West, and we think they are very obedient, but in the history of China, you do have prizes when things turn really absurd, like we have now. And you don't know how it will end up. We have many examples you know, from the beginning of the 20th century of uh, a prizing like this one, but it shows a face of China that we don't understand too well here, but when it looks very desperate, Chinese who are not necessarily you know, uh, outspoken can show a very brave face. And we have to pay tribute to those people as few as they can be. Like that man carrying flowers in Shanghai. Yes. And, and also showing the, 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 the white papers. You yeah, know, showing about blank pieces of paper yes. that denounce so, censorship. Yeah, imagine the courage it takes in a current environment to behave like this. Be they 100 people, 200 people, 300 people. In today's China, you have to be very brave to do that. And we have to pay tribute to that. All right. By the way, not everyone in China is looking forward to the easing of the country's uh, zero COVID policy. The Financial Times reports that sales of ventilators and oxygen machines have soared since November 11th. That was when authorities in Beijing first promised uh, a, a loosening of restrictions. Zhong Yang Lu, uh, uh, is there a silent majority, perhaps, that uh, wants uh, the uh, lockdown to be uh, later rather than sooner ended? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. A, a very interesting way to think about the, uh, the, the the composition within the Chinese people who are in supportive of the current zero COVID policy and who may not necessarily be. And I'm ex I'm in, I'm completely in agreement with our our panelists in that uh, the current zero implementation of zero COVID policies have been have created a tremendous amount of uh, uncertainty among Chinese people. And uh, it, the, the, un the uncertainty and the confusion are two aspects. One is with regard to they do not know for sure whether they are, they are going to leave their life from one lockdown to another with some intermediate, intermediate, intermediate time of sort of free movement, right? And then the other is more profound, which is with regard to they are uncertain about their economic future. It used to be the case that a civil servants think that they have the iron rice ball, but now uh, the gov local government who are last year only Shanghai government was not in deficit, but this year, simply every single local government are going to have to deal with a uh, difficult budget situation. And for the private sector, that is even a you know, way much more difficult situation. Therefore, people are confused. People are uncertain about the, the, what, where their life is going to be, both from COVID perspective as well as from economic perspective. That being said, many people are uncertain that they do not, because of the narratives and the, 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 the lack of um, advanced vaccines or the mRNA, right? So people are not sure what is going to happen if the government were totally remove uh, the zero COVID policy. Obviously, no people, especially people, the, the elderly, and they are not, they, they, are, they are highly aware that uh, China, Chinese hospitals are not necessarily in good in, in, in good capacity if China were to deal with a large, massive amount of um, 
zero COVID severe symptoms. And then on the other hand, if we are talking about the little children, and especially many of uh, the Chinese families only have a one, uh, cho- one child, uh, especially among the current generation, right? So that is going to be another, sort, another source of um, hesitancy with regard to they really do not know what is going to happen. Therefore, it really is a mixed option. And this presents a dilemma for the government. On the one hand, how are they going to handle the, 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 the protests and the related zero uh, anger against the zero COVID policy? And then on the other hand, how are they going to pay the cost of zero COVID? Jean-Paul Cheng, does this illustrate that uh, uh, China's demographics are brittle? We know that the uh, the country is aging fast, and so any possible slight change in that makes uh, the population and authorities nervous. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, but the problem of aging uh, population, I remember that uh, it has been uh, under consideration since now more than 10 years uh, among the top level uh, of the government. Uh, there have been, uh, but if it's the 70 year olds and, uh, and above who are not getting vaccinated or this, are most this, exposed yes, to Omicron. This is, this is another, another problem. 50% um, only of uh, population above the 80s uh, <clears throat> are, are supposed to be, uh, to have received a, a shot. Uh, the problem is again, we didn't have three years continuous COVID uh, situation in China. So when you're asking people in Shanghai around 70 years old, why don't you get this shot? They say, what for? Uh, we can go to the restaurant, uh, we make some tests, etc." That was before this spring, you know. So during, uh, uh, paradoxically, I mean, it's a paradox, you know, because they succeeded to manage the first period of the COVID in China, a lot of the age, um, uh, old people uh, didn't feel the, the, the necessity to go to, to, to get a shot. And do you see uh, Xi Jinping agreeing uh, uh, to import lots of uh, that, that, European-made uh, mnRNA vaccines? Uh, that's, um, I, I believe this is more speculative because uh, I, I, I'm not a specialist of all these vaccines, but it, it, it seems that the Chinese vaccines are good enough to avoid the severe consequence of, uh, of uh, contamination uh, can protect... Uh, Even with Omicron? Yeah. And, uh, well, if, which in, which, in which case that would challenge the reason for the lockdown? If, if, you, if, you're, not, if you're so sure about yeah, the vaccine, okay. why would you lock people down? Yes, but what, what I... But I the, 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 you know, <laughs> abandoning the zero COVID policy means yeah. we are confident that just vaccinating okay. the people okay. is enough. Yeah. To I, relaxing the, okay. the, 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 the rule. That's the point. All right. Now, what, what so why don't you do it? Because I, because, because I really believe the, lead, uh, the leadership has been focused on the 20th Congress. So they uh, underestimated the gravity of the situation uh, of COVID, in, uh, which started in April. And so, uh, but when they got the feedback from the society, they had all the monitoring, the surveillance system to to know exactly what people are feeling about all these restrictions, etc., they decided to take some new measures to lose, to <clears throat> to 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 make things suffer, and that's the the 20 measures that they, they try to put in place uh, to implement uh, on the uh, November 11, I believe. If you read the 20 measures carefully, actually, it's a catalog of all these uh, absurd decisions uh, which has been taken since. The spring, okay, but you, see, so they denounced all these things and they took the decision to push people to abolish all these absurd measures. It's a way to change the situation, but it's a little bit too late. First, right. it's a little bit too late because when they decide to soften the, the restrictions, it's just you are you are you are you 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 are having a. a uh, a huge raise of uh, the contamination rate right now. So they are taken into a, a contradiction and a problem of a conflict of timing. You know? so, uh, are you surprised, Mario Osman? Because it sounds, listening to Jean-Paul Chang, that uh, there's a bit of improvisation on the part of authorities. 
Well, I don't know if that's the word, uh, the correct word, but I think that it's really Xi Jinping's decision, you see, and I don't think... One man's has, decision. One man's decision, yeah. I don't think he's been asking around too much and trying to get some help for, from the best doctors and everybody to give him some kind of ideas. And I think this is all related to Xi Jinping's vision of China, how to govern China, the, the Chinese. Uh, he's imposing a totalitarian government and a totalitarian system. So in some ways, I, th I have the feeling that this uh, uh, COVID story uh, helps him because then he has a good reason to uh, control everybody, to uh, prevent anybody to talk, to, to do things. Uh, slowly, since 2015, we've seen a restriction of freedoms. Uh, so you're saying for him, it's, it's more important, it's, it's better to have... 1.4 billion people locked down than to have the economy restarting, as Jean-François was well, saying. Jean-Paul used the word absurd. I mean, Xi Jinping's strategy now seems to be absurd because the economy is going down. There's no reason for getting the economy down. Um, China can produce, China, China can sell. We're waiting for Chinese products. Uh, but yet he's completely closing up, closing up, closing up and restraining, restraining the Chinese. It, it, it doesn't sound right. And that's also part of their anger. Is, is, is that true that the economy has closed down? Because I, I spoke with one French importer this week who said his factories are, are working fine, 100 percent. Well, once again, we, we just have to, 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 to rely to what the French Chamber of Commerce said. I mean, who else but the business people in China uh, are able to, 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 to comment about uh, what's happening in the business world? And... The incredible thing is that the French embassy, for once, just relayed the message from the business. That's not the, it is part of the job of the French embassy, but the way the French embassy relayed this message means really something is yeah, happening. They reposted a, and, a, a well, communique by the Chamber of Commerce that complained about travel restrictions. Well, travel restrictions, but also the confusion and, 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 and the way things are becoming more and more difficult, and for one single reason, for example, there are other ones, but one single reason is that when you have an expatriate staff, when you have, you know, uh, uh, an investment abroad, you like to uh, check what's happening. You like to be on the ground to see what's happening. And this is not possible, you know, uh, even uh, the, the, the French Medef uh, so said so, that, that there is no uh, physical uh, way of checking what's happening in China. You are losing control. And, you know, for a manager, that's very important to keep control. Right. So the, the Euro French and more broadly, the Europeans uh, who are who are hurt uh, as well uh, by this uh, lockdown, uh, that complaint, of course, is very different from the sounds we're hearing uh, out of Washington, uh, where they're afraid that uh, uh, Beijing has too much of a hand in strategic uh, uh, technologies, uh, therefore uh, this ban on computer chips and the likes. Uh, and that brings us to the timing of Europe. Uh, remember when Pakistan's prime minister found himself in Moscow? It was a long planned trip, but it happened to be on the day Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Well, Europeans are wondering about the optics when Charles Michel touches down in just a few hours in Beijing. He's got a three-hour meeting planned with China's president, uh, the uh, president of the uh, uh, European Council. Is he doing the right thing, Mario Oxman, by going uh, to Beijing at this point in time? It's never the right time to go to Beijing. Never the right time. No, no, no. Uh -huh. because, because there are too many contradictions. We're supposed to be the European Union. We respect human rights. We're against death penalty. We have uh, selected the Sakharov Prize, uh, Ilham Torti, and Ilham Torti has been sentenced to life in prison. We have no news from him. So Mr. Charles Michel will have to ask about what's going on with Ilham Torti. If he doesn't do that, the prestige of the European Union just doesn't exist anymore. The Chinese know exactly what it means. You have to be brave. You give a prize to a Chinese, well then show your guts, ask for him, ask to see him. And will he dare do that or not? That's a problem. We talked a lot about the visit of the German chancellor who decided not to go with Emmanuel Macron, but solo uh, to Beijing uh, recently. What's this trip by the president of the European Council about? He's not going with 
the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der well, Leyen. I think, I, I think that's one, one of the points as well. Um, I, I, I would slightly disagree with Marie that it's never a good time to, to, to go to Beijing. You know, uh, going, going to Beijing well, at one point of time uh, becomes at one point of time becomes a necessity. No, possibly I agree. not. Possi it's a necessity, but it's a never, no, never the right no, time. Possibly <laughs> not. No, but the, the, the main point is the, is the one in my mind. The, the, the one you stress is that we are showing uh, uh, an image of Europe which is. Totally disbanded. You have the uh, German Chancellor who goes along, solo, as you said. You, you have uh, Charles Michel who possibly consults with uh, Margaret van Leyen and possibly with, 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 with the heads of uh, uh, France and, and other countries. But still, it shows that the, the European uh, Union um, has several heads who possibly do not agree between them, even though we do have stakes. And this is why I'm saying, yes, you do have moments where you do have to speak. To, and we do have um, uh, a meeting, supposedly, every year between European Union and China. We don't know what will happen with the EU-China uh, meeting. So that's one of the reasons why it might be a good reason. But, of course, you have to uh, control the parameters when you go and to deliver very strong messages, that is for sure. So, uh, Jean-Paul Chang, again, uh, Charles Michel, President of the European Council, he's the guy who answers to all the 27 leaders of the EU. Him showing up in Beijing in the midst of the biggest protests we've seen in years, uh, national protests in years. And, uh, uh, what's it, what, what, what is this trip about, you think? I believe, <clears throat> okay, after, after the, uh, the new nomination of uh, Xi Jinping as, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, for a uh, five-year new... new New term, uh, everybody wants to meet him, you know, and because now the situation is normally is stable. <clears throat> we have stabilization, political stabilization in terms of leadership. So you, you saw at the G20, everybody was uh, uh, <clears throat> asking the rendezvous, uh, meeting with. Uh, so even the American uh, start to have deeper. They, they spent uh, how much? Uh, three hours, 20 minutes uh, between Mr. Biden and Mr. Xi Jinping to talk about all the, this stuff. When you think that uh, with all this situation, economic situation in the West, uh, in the West, with all the difficulty Europe is going to face. OK, and you cannot uh, just let the Chinese and the Americans to talk about all this without having a direct contact with China, uh, especially when China is the biggest partner, commercial uh, trade partner of, uh, of Europe. You know, and Europe is facing a lot of huge problem. We are talking about recession. We're talking about inflation. And, you know, somehow you cannot just say uh, for I mean, very noble reasons of human defense of human rights, etc., which is always, it must be like this. We, we sh must show this position, of course. But you cannot, just because of this, forget the interest of the, the, the European people. Because so, we're, it, it's one of the biggest uh, economic actor in the world. And s somehow I didn't completely agree with uh, uh, the pessimist scenario about the Chinese economy. I believe that actually even the financial market priced, priced in already the, 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 the fact that maybe the Chinese economy has button uh, uh, already and we are going to see maybe a kind of a rebound of the Chinese economy right. and nobody, nobody wants to miss that. And of course, Europe, Europe don't want to miss that, you know. If, if China opens up. Uh, Zhang Lengdu, I don't know if outside your window there have been police sirens today. Uh, the French president is, is where you are, <laughs> in Washington. Uh, uh, you, your thoughts sitting in, in, in the U.S. Capitol, uh, when you hear us here in the studio in Paris uh, uh, talking about how the EU positions itself between uh, China and the uh, United States. Yes, I Yes, thank you for the great question. I, I, I think, yes, there are police sirens and mm. uh, people, uh, you know, President Macron is being treated as the highest state visit. So this is great. And America, <laughs> France is America's number, uh, the very early, the, the first ally of the United States. So this is very important. And uh, uh, I, I do think that um, it's this uh, Charles Michel's visit to China demonstrates 
leadership of the European Union, demonstrate the relevance of the European Union, specifically because this probably is a very critical moment in uh, China's, uh, at least in, in Xi Jinping's tenure. And in retrospect, if we all gather together three years down the road, we probably do not want this moment to be the moment when China completely turning inside. That is bad for the economy, not uh, not just for the Chinese economy, but also for the global economy. And then in terms of the agenda, I think at least there are th uh, four issues if uh, that are uh, very, very much high on the EU's uh, uh, policy list. The first one would be trade with China, and then secondly would be climate change, third would be food security, and then fourth, which is equally important, would be energy. And the reason I wanted to uh, highlight Mario this Mario is listening to you here. I, I don't hear human rights on your list. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is going to be a very difficult uh, topic to touch upon if um, if the European U if Jean Michel is going to get through you know trade and others. Remember, ten years ago in 2011, the EU had a trade deficit with China of about 129 billion dollars, and it maintains about at this that level. But the last year, the trade deficit with China expanded to 249 billion. Mm -hmm. So I think at this moment is really, a, especially when EU is facing a, a possible economic recession next year, it is important for the European Union mm. to figure out how to rebalance the trade with China. That's very practical. All right, before we go, uh, let's talk about China's other big story this Wednesday, the passing of its 96-year-old former president. Jiang Zemin served from 1993 to 2003. His reign as Communist Party leader was longer. It stretched from the uh, Tiananmen crackdown of 1989 to the handover of Hong Kong, of course, and a spectacular period of uh, double-digit growth. Uh, Jiang, too frail to attend last month's uh, Chinese Communist Party Congress. His successor, Hu Jintao, you see him there, was publicly humiliated, you might say, when he was ushered out under the eye uh, of the international press. Uh, the Xi way of dealing with power in stark contrast with that you could say of the more volubile Jiang Zemin, who spoke lots of languages, including in this year 2000 exchange with a Hong Kong journalist, Cantonese. Jean-François de Meglio uh, uh, telling off the, the, I think it was reported from the South China Morning Post, but I'm not certain. Uh, your thoughts when you look at that clip and, and you think about the Zhang years and compared to the Xi years? Well, there's something which strikes my mind, and I would like to, to quote Karl Marx. History repeats itself. In 1989, Tiananmen started with the passing of Hu Yawang. Mm -hmm. And now we have another reformer passing away. And that's Jiang Zemin. I don't know what will happen with the current uprising, but it strikes my mind very much that uh, probably some Chinese gods are playing with history and repeating history. Jean-Paul Chang? I, I'm not too sure that uh, he left the, uh, the same uh, kind of feeling than uh, uh, Hu Yaobang. Uh, he was very powerful, and uh, he is uh, considered as uh, the most powerful clan man in China. And his network is so huge that uh, Hu Jintao suffered during all his ten years of mandate. Okay, mm -hmm. and even Xi Jinping had been very, <laughs> very careful about uh, uh, all the the clan of Jiang Zemin. So he disappears now. Actually, it's. Uh, 
um, I don't think it would be a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, you, you explosion. You remember the sentence by what is, what is uh, of, uh, But this guy has, should be remembered as the guy who introduced the notion that uh, the Communist Party is representing the development of productive force in China. And that means all capitalists could become communists and vice versa. You know, it's uh, uh, what he called... Yeah, and it's a pact with the people that depends on growth, right? Uh, that he, he promised the on, Chinese people on develop, Yes, development of productive force in Marxist mm -hmm. term, but it means actually go invest, produce, make money, and uh, uh, that changed a lot. And uh, mm -hmm. it's the beginning of the middle class in China. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the second point you should really remember that is he... he who finalized the treaty about, uh, on the border with Russia and transformed completely the Sino-Russian relation for years to come. Mm. And he'd been trained in Russia in the 50s. And it's an uh, uh, explanation of some kind of capital of sympathy uh, that Moscow still benefit in Beijing. Mm. Marion uh, you when you compare then and now? Well, I, I agree with Jean-Francois. It might provoke a kind of nostalgic feeling because at that time there was hope. Uh, Jiang Zemin was not a very uh, soft leader at all. He was also a very strong leader. But still, everything was possible. Not sure, but possible. And he didn't close China. He opened it up. He had relationships with everybody, traveled everywhere. And he accepted uh, the, the coming of uh, foreigners and foreign investments. But uh, even more important for me, uh, he let social society, civil society, uh, to, to, to grow. You had more and more lawyers, you had more and more writers, you had more and more NGOs. And then afterwards, uh, you had Hu Jintao. It was a sort of neither cold nor hot uh, period. But then with Xi Jinping, everything closed down one after another. Now you have, you see, no, no lawyers, no NGOs, no relationships between the, both civil societies. So I think it might create a real sense of nostalgia. Uh, Zhong Yan Liu, we're almost out of time, but do you agree? Uh, yes, more or less so. And I would also want to emphasize that uh, Jiang Zemin is not a man without controversies, right? But, uh, he, uh, but, but then at the same time, uh, I remember reading some posts from my, my friends who live in China, and he described this in a way that I completely agree. He says, even if he does not uh, re he does not miss Jiang Zemin himself, or he does not miss Jiang Zemin as a leader. He definitely miss and will remember the era that uh, Jiang Zemin kicked China and lead China into. And I think that was very well said. Mm -hmm. So, Lang Liu, I want to thank you so much for being with us uh, from Washington. I want to thank uh, as well Marie Oltzman, Jean-François Dimeglio, Jean-Paul Chang. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.